When he was asked about the future of science at the turn of the century, Stephen Hawking replied that he believed the 21st century would become the century of complexity. That was a huge endorsement for the field, which, for the most part, is living up to the expectation, with complex systems starting to sprout seemingly everywhere. It's truly an exciting moment to be working on complexity, but there are also major roadblocks looming ahead. Take, for example, particle physics. It started from the atoms, went down to the nuclei, then the quarks, then, well, we don't know yet, but we do know where to look inside quarks. And sure, it's possibly the greatest technical challenge ever undertaken by humanity, but at least it's a field with a clear path forward. We know what to do next, however difficult that may be. But in complex systems, we don't. We have different people pushing for different approaches, which, yes, it's true for any science to some degree, but in complexity science, there is so much fragmentation that we don't even have a common ground to work upon. A quick Google search will show how there are even several different definitions of what is a complex system, and by consequence, a lack of a universally agreed upon one. So instead, each field of research uses their own ever so slightly different characterization. And despite this, we have produced amazing results, which unfortunately, and yet unsurprisingly, are sometimes not compatible with one another. So to solve this mess, and in order to be able to look forward to a unified complexity science, we first need to take a look back. Just 20 miles or so south of Albany, along the banks of the Hudson River in upstate New York, the New York Training School for Girls was built as a correctional facility for underage women. Opened in 1904 in the town of Hudson, its purpose was to house and correct teenage girls that were convicted of any form of juvenile delinquency or being found associated with vicious and dissolute persons willful disobedience to parents or guardians, or any criminal offence. And it was in this unassuming place in the New York countryside that the 21st century complexity boom started brewing. In 1932, long before anyone had spoken about complex systems, the school saw a wave of runaways. In the short span of a few weeks, 14 girls ran away, at a rate over 30 times the average. This was highly unusual, and perhaps understandably so, given that the institution was not really a prison, but rather a safe space for the girls to recover from a spotted past. Reports show that it was equipped with four tennis courts, two basketball fields, and four croquet fields. Education was provided for free, alongside training in occupations like sewing, cooking, and housekeeping. In order to understand the root causes of these rampant cases of runaways, the headmaster called psychiatrist Jacob Moreno to investigate. The traditional psychiatric practice would have searched for some personal, individual traits in the runaway girls. But Moreno didn't find any significant concerns in the girls' personalities, so he considered a different hypothesis. He suggested that the spike in runaways was prompted by the network of social relations that had been established in the group. In other words, he suggested that this was a network effect, a group behavior if you want. And he was able to prove his theory by simply asking the girls about the friendship that had been established among them and jotting down a few simple graphs in which he used the information from the interviews to reconstruct the friendship networks. He found that the first girls to run away were the ones that occupied the central positions in the school friendship network, which sparked a flood of imitation behavior. Fast forward to today, and while we have developed the language and we have studied the phenomena in much more depth than Moreno ever did, epistemologically we haven't made that much of a progress since his findings. And while that might have been good enough for the 30s, it's certainly not enough anymore.
Before the 90s, there are only some scattered examples of using networks to solve problems, and even fewer conceptual advancements. The most notable ones are the introduction of the random graph by Erdos and Rene in 1959, and a very rudimentary form of community detection in the work by Zachary on its famous Karate Club network, which dates back to the 70s. However, in the 90s, network science blossomed, and research paper began to emerge left and right. And it's no coincidence that this followed the creation of the two most important and consequential networks of all times, the Internet and the World Wide Web. Together, they solved the problem that had, until that point, fatally wounded the development of network and complexity science, the lack of data consolidation. After all, that's what the World Wide Web is all about, or in the words of its creator, Tim Berners-Lee, a universal linked information system allowing a place to be found for any information or reference which one felt was important and a way of finding it afterwards. So the web created a large database of readily available data set for complexity scientists around the world. For example, the information about research authors were dispersed in millions of paper references, and so they couldn't be used to study co-authorship networks effectively. That is, until Google Scholar came about and compiled them into easily accessible databases. Twitter, tracking the uses of different hashtags, made possible to investigate how opinions interact when we discuss different topics. Chemical reactions had been discovered over the span of two centuries, but it wasn't until the 90s that they were compiled into online databases, which allowed to study the biochemical networks within a cell. All these modern data sets are huge. Facebook has more than 3 billion users, each connected, on average, to roughly 150 people. It is, without a doubt, the most comprehensive database of human friendships that has ever been compiled. Okay, probably acquaintances, but my point still stands. Or Wikipedia, which has almost 7 billion articles, all referenced and linked to dozens, if not hundreds, others. It's so well linked, in fact, that it has been turned into a game. No, seriously, go check out the Wikipedia game. It's so addictive and trains your lateral thinking like nothing else. And don't get me wrong, all this is good. It means that we are not confined to small pouches like Moreno was, only focusing on the sociology of a small group of people, quite literally separated from the rest of the population. And this shifted the prospect. Before, we only knew about our small neighborhood. Now, we have the whole system at our disposal. And from here, surely it must only take a few short deductive steps to reach the prime principle behind it all, right? The end game of complex systems must now be within reach, or so we like to tell ourselves. In reality, the scale of modern datasets raise an endless list of problems. Large systems are unintuitive and difficult to visualize. On one hand, Moreno's sketches are simple, clean, and easy to understand. They leave little to interpretation, and they present a clear conclusion and a transparent window on how such conclusion is reached. On the other hand, if you try to plot a similar graph with, say, a few hundred nodes, which is actually quite small for modern standards, you get a random mess that doesn't make any sense, an endless sea of confusion and garbled noise. So how do we navigate it? The question, how do we solve a scientific problem, is essentially the same thing as asking how does science work? It's, well, it's complex, and to some degree more akin to philosophy than it is to science, and something that I am absolutely not qualified to talk about. But perhaps we can get around that if we leave abstraction behind and look at the more practical aspects of it for a second. When we look through this lens, we see science as a process of assimilation and encapsulation. 
Assimilation happens when we observe two things that are apparently different, but really are just manifestations of the same phenomenon. That's what happened with gravity, when Newton realized that the same force that makes object fall is also responsible for keeping planets from drifting apart in the far darkness of space. Or when we discovered that electricity and magnetism are really the same thing, and so we started speaking of electromagnetism ever since. Scientists love when two different things can be brought under the same umbrella. It makes the theory so much simpler, more complete, and more elegant. And this, in essence, is the assimilation process at work. On the other hand, when a theory has exhausted its scope, and we develop a new, more extensive theory that encompasses the previous one, that's when we have encapsulation. The handbook example of this is classical mechanics which works perfectly fine for everyday objects at human scales, but it's inadequate to describe objects that are either very fast or very small, or both. Einstein developed relativity for the former, and Planck, Schrödinger, and a few others developed quantum mechanics for the latter. But crucially, both these theories reduce to classical mechanics when the condition of classical mechanics are satisfied. In other words, the results from classical and relativistic mechanics for a car traveling down the highway are essentially the same, and they only differ by a few parts per billion. This is encapsulation at work, the extension of an old theory with a new theory that matches the old one when both are valid. Today, complexity science has undergone part of the assimilation process, recognizing that different complex systems can be represented and studied using a unified language. Networks play a central part in this. The World Wide Web has pages connected by hyperlinks, social networks have people connected by friendships, and metabolic networks have proteins connected by chemical reactions. And despite the fact that all those networks come from different processes, from evolution to human collaboration to the laws of physics, formally, they are the same thing. They are, well, just a network. And while the networks behind these systems all have very different characteristics, it is still possible to identify some basic universal properties across them. This is definitely a step in the right direction, and a cornerstone of the assimilation process. Much like the case of classical mechanics, however, the real breakthrough happens when encapsulation takes place. The future of network science and complex systems is a bottomless source of debates between those who believe we should pursue hypergraph versus the supporters of machine learning approaches, between those who prefer using, I don't know, nonlinear corrections to partial differential equations, and those who instead investigate complex systems with nothing but Monte Carlo methods. And to be clear, all those approaches are scientifically valid and will likely continue to bring significant scientific discoveries for the foreseeable future. But what I believe we need, now more than ever, is a more fundamental paradigm shift. For me, it's time to stop working exclusively on assimilation and start instead focusing on encapsulation. For me, the end game of complexity science should be to abstract all the existing complex systems into an all-encompassing mathematical representation. Many think that this would be either outright impossible or, at the very least, so abstract and removed from real use cases to be impractical for day-to-day -day use. And to them I say, so be it. I don't think it's nearly as big of a problem as you are making it. We already have many examples of this, including relativity and quantum mechanics. The fact that we have quantum mechanics doesn't mean that we use an infinite-dimensional quantum state vector just to 
calculate, I don't know, the acceleration of a falling body. Nor have chemists stopped using moles and started solving Schrodinger equations for simple reactions. But the conceptual content and the theoretical advancements are now made in quantum theory. Well, actually, quantum field theory nowadays. We've gone a step further on that front. And that has made possible incredible advances that were not only impossible, but outright unthinkable before quantum mechanics was introduced. So, if you ask me what's my dream for complexity science, it's quantum complexity or rather, a quantum mechanics equivalent to all of the theories that are circulating right now. A terrifyingly complicated and abstract model that works with the most advanced and abstract mathematical functors in categorical spaces, which actually, for some reason, this is the most difficult thing I can think of, and I don't really know why. But anyway, you take your system, whichever complex system you have, and you encode it into this mathematical cumbersome way. And then you perform some sort of operation on it. And crucially, this operation will be the same regardless of what system you fed to this mathematical monstrosity. And once you're done, you project it back onto your system and you get your answer. If you're not a mathematician, I get it. It looks needlessly complicated, and almost comically so, but it's not. It's beautiful. The same operation for finding communities on a social network, or the best route of a roadmap, or even the best optimization for the weights in your neural network. Having this formalism in place would be like having solved complex systems in some sense, having solved complexity itself. We'd be able to predict election results from Facebook friendships, predict where a virus will spread next, and many, many more predictions that today are just confined in science fiction. Because, yes, we're not even close to having anything like that. And perhaps it's going to be another century before we get anything remotely close to that. Or perhaps we are about to witness a breakthrough a few years down the line. Or maybe this supra system doesn't even exist. I don't know. What I am sure, however, is that we might have come a long way from Moreno and his sociometric graph sketches, but a far, far longer way lies ahead of us. If you are still watching, thank you for sticking with me until now. I really hope you liked this video. This video is special to me because it's my biggest YouTube project so far, and yet I wasn't able to include everything I wanted. In this video, I've taken for granted quite a few basic concepts and results in complex systems, but don't worry, I have other videos linked in the video description that covers every single one of them. Check them out, let me know how you find them, and please consider subscribing to the channel for more videos like this coming out twice a week on Wednesdays and Sundays. And until next Sunday, goodbye.